police is because um, the title is very interesting. It says the fruitful grain of wheat, the fruitful grain of wheat. And, and uh, this title uh, mentions wheat and because Jesus will use, will use this figure to talk about something that he would experience. All right, and that's that's what uh, verse twenty three is all about. Remember that what's happening here in the fruitful grain of wheat twenty verses twenty through twenty six is as a result of Philip and Andrew bringing uh, Greeks to Jesus to see Jesus. In, in other words, the Greeks the Greeks are coming to see Jesus. They came to Philip, and Philip brought them to Andrew so that both together can bring it to Jesus, right? And and. Uh, and so that is the context of this conversation, of this teaching that Jesus is about to, to give in verse 23 through 26. And so especially, and then we move to a different section. But, but the, uh, the, the title uh, kind of struck my attention, uh, caught my attention because of the wheat part. And the question that we had to ask ourselves here is, what, what is why is Jesus using the wheat? Why is Jesus using wheat to represent what is that he is going he is about to experience and so that is what we are going to be uh dealing with today and that is verse 23 and so he says so again remember the the greeks and then philip and andrew are coming to jesus jesus sees them and uh, then he says then he says the following what is found in verse 23 but jesus answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified and so we already talked about this, but I want you <clears throat> to keep in your mind that we are in the second half of the, of the gospel, which means we are now entering into the last days of Jesus on earth, right? Right before the cross, right after the cross. And so we, we need to keep that in our minds because Jesus now is preparing the disciples even more um, drastically and vividly than before. Because all the three and a half years were preparation uh, of, of the disciples. But these days right before the cross are actually preparation for what they are about to experience. And that uh, namely is the, the, uh, the apparent uh, loss of, his, of their master. And so, but Jesus answered then saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so that, that we already talked about the glorification and how Jesus links uh, the cross with with uh, uh, his glory, and that is very important to see how uh, God's perspective to of of the of the cross is. And I just want to take a second to to say hi to Sheila. Thank you for being with us today. And then verse twenty four will take us into what Jesus, uh, uh, the metaphor that Jesus will use to describe the glorification on the cross. And so verse twenty four says, "Most assuredly, I said to you." Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Okay, and so for us to understand what Jesus, why Jesus is using this metaphor, Jesus is using this, um, this uh, element to represent what he is going to experience, we need to know the place of wheat in the Bible. Can anyone tell us why Jesus why, why is Jesus using this, this element here at this point? Does anyone have, a, does anyone have any, anything to say on that? Just that, that they were familiar with being in an agri agricultural um, culture. Right. And so why would they understand this? They are, they are familiar with wheat. Okay. They know what wheat is. They know how to plant it. They know how to harvest it. They know how to, um, how to, process it so that they can eat it. Um, so what will they, they have in their minds when they hear Jesus using wheat to represent it, to teach something else? The only thing I think of is that <laughs> ahead, he's the bread of life, right? Jesus is the bread of life. Okay, okay. I like that. I like that. And, and we, need, we need to make a, a bridge between the bread and wheat, right? In, in that, but I, I saw Pastor David before we go there. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking it's used in offerings and such. Yes. For instance, the weight, the weight 
wave sheath offering? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So is is it was part of the one of the offerings uh, given in the temple, or that were acceptable uh, offerings in, in the temple? What else? What else? What else do you guys see? Why, why would Jesus use wheat? <clears throat> Well, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 8, you can check that later, you will see that there are six uh, species that are used again and again in that agricultural culture to teach a spiritual, um, a spiritual realities. And so in the Old Testament, you will, feel, you will see that again. Uh, and those, those seven, I, I, I can give it to you. So wheat is one of them. Barley is another one. Then you have uh, grapes, figs, pomegranates, and olive, and of course dates. You, you'll find these products mentioned again and again in the Old Testament. They happen to be also the, the seven um, acceptable offerings in the temple. And so among those seven that I mentioned, again, wheat, barley, grape, fig, pomegranate, olive, dates, among those seven, Wheat is the one that represents something very interesting. Wheat represents the provision of God. In the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish mind, when they use this wheat, they are thinking about how God has provided for them. Now, very interesting. I think it's very interesting because Jesus now would use that, that same element to... to um, explain that the experience that he is about to have what is jesus by using wheat telling them about his experience about his presence before we go to the sanctuary that i want to also take you for for a minute what do you think what is jesus saying here that that his death is not the end of all things all right all right okay what else what else what is jesus saying yes Pastor David. well there's one thing i like that I saw in the verse, and that is, um, it's, it talks about that if it doesn't die, that it'll be alone. And it shows us that God doesn't want to be alone. Mm, yep, yep. That's great. Now, listen again, friends, please. Oh, cool. Listen this, listen to this. So wheat is a symbol of God's provision. And now Jesus uses wheat to represent him or to represent himself. Mm -hmm. Here's the question. What is Jesus saying to the hearers here and to us today about himself? And remember what, what is about to happen. Sacrifice. Yes. yes. What about the sacrifice? That he is going to be the sacrifice. And that, oh. What? Yes, yes. Continue. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and that uh, upon his sacrifice, um, those who, who grasp the, the, the sacrifice um, uh, for themselves will become the fruit of that, will become the, they will provide the, his death will provide um, the ongoing of Christianity or the faith. Yes, yes, great, thank you. Uh, Pastor David, will you, what, were you trying to say something? No, okay, that's fine, that's fine. But, but again, uh, follow, follow the reasoning, follow the reasoning, really close, really close, because the answer is right there in the reasoning. Wheat is the provision of God. Jesus comes and uses wheat to tell them something about himself. What is Jesus saying about himself by using wheat? I, James, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know if this is the right answer, but I just think about when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Jesus being the word of God, bread represents also the word. So, I mean, he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we can't have life no other way, but only through Jesus. I don't, amen. I don't know if that's answering your yes, question. Amen, amen. All, all those answers are correct. But I, I, the, the, uh, the reasoning is simple. 
Wheat is the provision of God. Jesus uses wheat. What is Jesus telling? He is to his audience. He is the provision of God. He is the provision of God. Provision of Jesus just said, Jesus just said um, the son of God, the son of man is about to be glorified. So what is about to happen on the cross is the provision of God for the debt we have with him. Jesus is the provision. The wheat is the, is the symbol that Jesus uses to tell us, to teach us that he's the provision. He is the ultimate provision given for man. Again, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is, this is the offering that God is given on our behalf. The son gives his life as the ultimate provision of God for our sinful, for our sinful lives. For the consequences of what we have gotten ourselves into. So, which provision of God? Jesus, using wheat, is telling us he is the ultimate provision. Ultimate provision of God. Do you see it now, friends? Yes. Okay, so, and, and then again, and then again, what, what, uh, what uh, Terry was saying, what James was saying, the, the, all that goes, goes hand to hand. It's actually go along. But I'd like to go back to what uh, James was saying in the beginning, talking about bread, and he made a connection, the spiritual connection with the bread of life and even the Bible and so on. So, of course, the best product that comes out of wheat is bread, correct? The most, the most, the most uh, popular one is bread. Yes. Is bread. So they were very, very um, familiar with bread, and they knew that bread came from wheat, right? So what is bread a symbol of? That bread was a daily oh. food for them. It was a daily food. It's also on the sanctuary. Yes, we are gonna go there. Uh, That's what I'm going to go there. It's part of the symbol of, of yeah. Yes, sir. The show yes, bread. Sir. Yes, sir. That's what I, I, I was, I'm going there. So so bread, bread is a symbol, is, is a, the result of, of wheat. Right, and it was a daily meal for them, a daily uh, food for them. So that actually is a reminder for the Jew of the provision of God. Bread was a reminder for the Jew of the provision of God. Now, with that thought in mind, we move ourselves all the way to the sanctuary, and we find bread in the holy place. Right, twelve pieces of bread. 12, 12 pieces of bread, 12 loaves of bread, if you please. Now, in the century, the, the 12 uh, pieces of bread represented the, the uh, presence of God, right? And it, the, it needed to be there constantly, like uh, day after day. They would replace it uh, after seven days and all that, day after day. Uh, on the Sabbath, they would replace a new, they would put a new um, a group of, group of uh, bread and so it was a constant reminder of the presence of God the presence of God and the provision of God are one and the same because it's because God is with us that we receive the blessings that God has for us now the greatest of all the presence of God the great the greatest of all the provisions of God is the one that is coming in chapter 12 and says just like the wheat, and uses and uses to describe what he is about to do. We uh, uses this particular element out of the seven that were acceptable in the temple. He uses wheat. He didn't use barley. He didn't use uh, grape, figs, pomegranate, uh, olives, or even dates. He used that particular one, wheat. The only one that is found in in the, in the sanctuary. Okay, Pastor Dave. Uh, Ellen White brings out that the table of showbread is the is God's throne in the holy place, just like the ark is the mercy seat is God's throne in the most holy place. And so when in the Bible we see that Christ moves from the holy place to the most holy place. The throne that is left vacated is the 
table of showbread throne. Um, the interesting thing is this bread is on the table of showbread. And so it's like Jesus represents to before the Father, mankind, as well as represents God to us. Um, Jesus is on the throne of God mm -hmm. as the bread of life, mm -hmm. but he also has 12 representing the tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which means in a sense that mankind, those that overcome, will sit down with me on my throne mm -hmm. also. And I thought that was interesting. Right, right, great. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. James, go ahead, please. I just wanted to add something too to what Pastor was saying, as well as the, the show bed. Um, <clears throat> I heard a, a really cool sermon from Pastor Doug Batchelor a while back saying that there's three elements of spiritual fitness. And they are eating, or they're breathing, eating, and exercising. Uh, if you're breathing, you're praying, which the altar of incense represents praying. If you're eating, it represents the showbread, which is being in God's word. And the exercise is uh, the, the, light, the, cat, uh, the candlestick, which represents our light, which is um, being a witness to others, sharing the good news, the everlasting gospel. Right. And, I think another interesting thing is the number 12, because doesn't 12 represent God's church? Yes. Doesn't that usually symbolize God's church? So that's all I wanted to say. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have you seen, uh, have you have you come across the uh, a series on our YouTube channel on the gospel in a building, James? Have you, have you heard about that? The gospel in a building? James? Okay, we went away. <laughs> yes, something, something is happening with your microphone now what was your question again i'm sorry i was i was asking if you have watched on our youtube channel uh our church youtube channel uh the gospel in your building no but I, if you send me the link i'll definitely watch it okay i i'll, I'll send it to you then uh we talked about those those Particulars that you were talking about. I, I haven't watched. Oh, okay. I haven't watched Doctor uh, Pastor uh, Bachelor's series on that, but uh, this one talks about that too. Okay. Okay. Awesome, yeah. awesome. But that's that's a great that's a great comparison. Again, the twelve the twelve um, uh, loaves of bread representing God's people goes along with what Pastor David was saying, right? If that is the, the throne of God and Jesus, the throne of Jesus, and Jesus does invite us to rule with Him. Uh, to be to be kings and queens with him, that is where we are going to uh, sit, and that is our symbolism. That is our representation as as God's people, the redeemed, the redeemed of, of the land. And so, very interesting, very interesting. Verse twenty four says, "Then as most assuredly I said to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. So, without death, without death, there is not." Uh, any benefit, but again, remember, he's he's using this to represent his glorification. Okay, so Moses should have said to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, unless. So if it doesn't happen, the other the the result would not take place. It remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much. It produces much grain. So he's. Using this agricultural language with people that understood how this worked, but he's not teaching agriculture agriculture to them. He's using this to mean something bigger than that. Go ahead, Terry. I just thought that that particular scripture, number twenty-four, is such a beautiful image of the the cross and the tomb you know how he was laid in the ground mm -hmm. and that um like you were saying if he hadn't died 
and gone into the ground. Mm. Nothing would have happened. There'd be no salvation. Uh, controversy be over. Somebody else would win. Um, but but he did. He did come and he did die and he did go into the tomb and um, and and. And it's even showing glorification part with uh, producing much grain. Because after his ascension, um, what he had done on the cross was glorified through, um, through the apostles and the disciples and everybody that came after. Thank you. Thank you. So, so again, the, this beautiful comparison that we see the way uh, Terry put it too, really, really good. In verse 25 then, so this is what, what happens with the, with the grain of wheat. Jesus will, is using this now to say something else. Let's see what he says in verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, when Jesus is talking about the cross, because we know that's what he's referring to by, uh, by being glorified and the wheat of grain dying to give, to give much grain, produce much grain. Why is he now going from himself and what he's talking about himself to what will happen with us? He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What? Why is he bringing us or bringing the believer into this conversation? Did I see your hand, uh, Ms. Sharon? Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is back a verse. Uh, actually, some of the fruit of Jesus dying was when he was resurrected. Uh, when there was an earthquake, when he died, people came out of their graves. And then when he was resurrected, those people were resurrected too, and they were the first fruits or the multiplication of the seed dying, uh, having the seed, but some of the multiplication was already done. Even before the ascension, you mean, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. That's right, that's right, that's right. So again, again, my question, my question. So. Jesus is using the wheat and the dying of the, of the grain to produce much grain to talk about the glorification which happens on the cross. Now, in verse 25, we already read that he moved from what he is about to do in, in the symbolism of the wheat to what the believer would do. In verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Why is he making this move? Why is, is the move necessary at this moment? Can anyone take that question? I would, oh, go ahead. You go, you go, you go, Pastor David. Go okay. ahead. Um, well, he's, it's referring back to the last verse mm -hmm. if you hate your life and that's the same as being planted and if you love your life it's the same as not being planted so if all we do is live for ourselves we're going to be alone but if we live for others We'll have lots of people around us in heaven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, the, Terry, I saw your hand. Go ahead. I was just going to add, it uh, reminds me of that scripture that talks about he who loves his life will lose it. And he who, how's it go? Hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Yeah, that's that, that, that's verse twenty-five. That's that's what we are. Oh, sorry. Right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, 
what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make about that scripture was um, if um, we aren't willing to sacrifice, if we're, if we're not living a life of self-sacrifice, if we're not dying to our own desires, our own passions, our own appetites, um, our own um, uh, drive for, for our competition for power, if we're not dying to all of that, if we're not dying to all of that, we will not produce any fruit for the kingdom of heaven. Okay, and so why, oh, yeah. is, that, why is that important, Terry? That, do part what you said. That's a great, a great statement there. Why is that important to be brought at this moment by Jesus when he is teaching about what he is about to do? I think he wants to know that he's, his, he's the example. Mm -hmm. Everything that he did in his life was as an example for all of us. And, and he's saying, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to die and that's going to produce a lot. And if you're willing to do that, you can be, you can produce a lot also. I think that's the same thing Dave, Pastor David said. That's the same yeah, thing you so, said? Yeah, so. Uh, Brother James, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I think about the text where it says the wages of sin is death. And, you know, we're all sinners. The Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. So there's nothing that we can do in our own effort to gain eternal life. And so if we continue to live a life of sin, the result of that is death. So there's no way that, that we can even inherit the kingdom of, of God's heaven uh, without um, Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And it's only through his robe of righteousness that we can gain eternal life. So if we have any sort of selfish intent, to try to save our own life, uh, in the end, um, it's only death. It's only his righteousness. Yes, yes, yes. So verse 25 again comes after verse 24 when Jesus is using the wheat analogy to talk about his sacrifice. So the question is, why is Jesus bringing us into the picture if he's talking about himself? And here is the, the answer is simple, and it goes attached again to what Terry was saying and Pastor David also, and James also touched some of that. And he says, at the end of verse 25 says, it produces much grain. Mm -hmm. So the fruit is going to be abundant, right? A lot. But if you are not believing, surrendering, and giving your life to the one that will produce, the, 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 the will give the abundant produce, then that means that you are not going to be part of that much grain. And so Jesus is bringing us into the picture for us to know you can, even though he's going to produce a lot of fruit, you can decide not to be part of that, of that result. How do we decide to be part of that result? Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates this world, this, his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So why are we there in the picture? Because though Jesus died on the cross, though Jesus was glorified on the cross, though Jesus had to die so that uh, much grain, much fruit would be produced, that you can, by your own decision, be not part of that much produce, much grain that Jesus is talking about. Do you see it, friends? Yes. So that, that's, why, that's why he's bringing us in. It's important the decision that we make uh, uh, is very important for what the result of his sacrifice is. We can, can, everyone can be saved. But if you decide not to, you will not. Terry, go ahead. It's also saying that if you want eternal life, this is the way you have to go. This, this is the path. This is that narrow path that you have to go. And if you're, if you're, um, uh, if you're going down that broad path, you're not going to have that eternal life. 
right? And so he continues describing verse 26. He says, hey, if anyone serves, so again, adding knots into the picture. You, in other words, Jesus is saying, yes, I'm going to do this. It's going to happen. It's going to, it's going to um, credit to your account, or he's going to have, he's going to put funds in the bank account so that the check you receive will have funds for you to cash it, right? But it's up to you to take that um, check to the bank and cash it. If you do not take the check to the bank and cash it, you will not get the cash. That's what, that's what he's saying. That's why he's bringing us into the picture in verse 25. And he will do it again and give us more information in verse 26. And he says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. So service is what the follower does. And then, and where I am there, my servant, the one that is following, the one that is serving me, will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. 26, 26. Yes, go ahead, Sister Shea. We could say that Jesus is the bank. And when we go to cash the check, Jesus is the one that gives the funds, so to speak. Yes, yes, yeah. He's the one that puts put the, fan, the, the funds in the, in the bank. Yes, go ahead, Pastor David. There's one interesting thing when you think of verse 24. Uh -huh. All those other seeds that came up came out of the one seed, which is Jesus. He's, like, he's our father seed. And we're like him unless we don't want to be like him. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is, we're not a separate entity in this. We came from him, and we become like him. And just like he went in the ground and multiplied mm -hmm. and became many seeds, so then we go into the ground, unless, of course, we're made into bread and someone eats us, but it, then we go into the ground and we multiply and become like fathers too to our children. And it's interesting that Paul, a lot of times, would call his disciples his children, or he would say, I'm their father or like their father. But... Um, Jesus is our father for all of us. Mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. So continuing with that same, same uh, line of thought, uh, we are in verse 26 now. Did and you I see Tammy's you... comment? I'm sorry? Did you see Tammy's comment? Jesus is our example. We should lay our life down as a friend. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Go, go ahead, uh, James. James. You there? Sorry, I, I was on mute. Okay. I said I was thinking about we were talking about the seed. And I noticed that there's a parable about the seed and the, the sower and how the seed represents the word again. Mm -hmm. the word of god so mm -hmm. like almost in a, in a sense when we're following christ we can't help not to say something we, we have to say something you know his last command when he went to heaven was go therefore and teach all nations so it's, it's our duty and obligation to share the everlasting gospel yes. to anyone that we encounter and that's kind of what we do when we're a follower of christ yeah yeah and that has to do actually with the word um serve serve that we find in verse 26 let me make the connection with what you said james in verse 26 again we read if anyone serves me let him follow me so a follower of jesus serves jesus that's what a follower is a follower of jesus serves jesus it's not just one that studies the bible is one that does something with that study that he does a follower of jesus serves jesus go ahead pastor 
One other thing I thought was interesting, all of this talk about seed goes back to the first promise of salvation. When it said, thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus is called the seed there. And as Paul liked to say, that seed singular. Mm -hmm. Right. Talking about Jesus. So, so uh, Genesis 3.15 is the proto uh, the proto gospel, right? He's talking about he's talking about Jesus, and so Jesus comes here and he uses another seed, wheat, which is a symbol of God's provision, and uh, and he uses us to talk about himself. But I, I want us to to elaborate a little more on twenty six. Can we do that? Can we can we talk about twenty six now? Verse twenty six. So go ahead, Terry. Um, the thing that that verse twenty six reminded me of. Um, when it says that we will be his, or he says, you will serve me, follow me, uh, where I am, my servant, serve me, my father will honor. Um, what that reminds me of is um, if, it, if we, it's the opposite. Oh, now I lost, lost the scripture. Um, but if it, if in it's in Psalm 51 I can't remember exactly but when David was talking about his sin and and we think about what happened to Uriah we think about what happened to Bathsheba but uh, and ultimately the baby um, uh, he said against you and you alone have I sinned now that one I'm still teasing out but but the point I'm making is he's talking about the sin went against God. And it's like, this is like the opposite of it. So like, if you're sinning, you're sinning against God. If you're serving, you're serving God. Or you're not. But you know what I'm saying? Right, 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 right. So uh, this again, 26 is what you're talking about, Terry. Thank you very much. So. If anyone serves, we're still talking about those who can be part of the much grain that Jesus says that his glorification will produce. He says, if anyone serves me, um, let, uh, let him follow me. Again, a follower serves him. And I wanted to make the connection with what James said, because I thought, I thought that's what the verse 26 is actually talking about. And uh, because... Um, the word serve or, or the verb to serve is the word where we get in the Greek, where we get the, the, the name for an office in the church. Deacons is the word diacono in, 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 the, in the Greek. And that word then is translated into serve. So let me ask you this question. What is a deacon? What is a deacon in the church? One who serves. So according to the Greek diakoneo, which is what is translated into to serve here, is one that serves, simply, right? One, one that serves. Okay, so how is a deacon, what you see in the church, a, a deacon, according to the definition that Terry just gave us, one that serves. Don't forget the context where we're studying this. Yes, Pastor David. Can, well, I'd like to take it, but it may be a, a little bit um, weird sounding in a sense. <laughs> um, we've been talking about wheat, uh -huh. which the only reason wheat is good is if we make it into bread. Yes. And in John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no place with me. And here, this text says, if any man serve me, mm -hmm. and we have the deacons serve the bread. 
maybe the serving is serving the bread, yes. which the bread is Jesus. Yes. And so bread of life. And so if we serve Jesus, then the Father honors us. Yes, that's exactly what we were looking for, friends. Remember the context is talking about wheat, and we already saw that the food that comes out of wheat is bread. And James already uh, brought us a couple of times to the importance of the Word of God and the importance of testimony and witnessing. And so what is a deacon to do? A deacon is to serve. Serve what? Serve the food. The Word serve of God. the food. Serve bread. The Word of God. A deacon is not one that is selected in the church to uh, collect offerings and, and tithing offerings. Though we have made a deacon for that in our church, sadly. A deacon is not one that has to vacuum the church and, and, and has to uh, repair things that are broken. That's what we have made out of a deacon. Biblically speaking, a deacon is everyone in the church. Every member of the body of Christ is to be a deacon. And a deacon is one that serves, but serves food, bread, the bread of life. A deacon is wow, one that's awesome. that spreads the word to, with everyone. And when a, a believer of Jesus meets Jesus, falls in love with Jesus, and knows who Jesus is, that, that believer will have nothing else to do. Nothing else will stir up his heart as much as to understand the privilege that it is to serve bread to others. And so that's what this section is all about, friends, is again a reminder of us being deacons, us being deacons and deaconesses, and ready always to serve. When we serve others, we're serving God. Why? Because we're serving Jesus to others. That's our responsibility. Just like Philip, which is the context of this, just like Andrew, uh, Andrew, which is the context of this. We are still in the thing. We, have, we haven't gone anywhere. We are right here. The text, the, the, the uh, pericope, as this is called, the, the section of the, of the Bible, talks, it started with Philip and it started with Andrew. What did Andrew and Philip do? All that they did was to serve. To serve. They brought the bread to them. All right. We're going to end there, friends. It's uh, nine more minutes to to off, but I think it's, it's time to, for us to pray. We need to, we need to dedicate. That's time. so beautiful. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.